Hey, everybody. Welcome to a very special edition of Tim's Vinyl Confessions. And uh, if you're an Alice Cooper fan, this is going to be an especially special episode, especially special that I just say that. Uh, excited to have Mr. Mike Medes uh, with me here. And Mike, you uh, probably follow him on Instagram if you're an Alice Cooper collector, because that's what he calls himself, Alice Cooper collector. And he lives up to the name. He has got mighty, mighty impressive collection of Cooper memorabilia. Uh, we're going to find out all about uh, how he came into this uh, collecting habit. Uh, everything, basically, you wanted to know anything about Alice Cooper, Mike's your guy. Mike, thanks very much for uh, talking to me today. Thanks very much, Tim. It's uh, anybody who calls me up and says, hey, you want to talk about Alice Cooper for an hour or so? I will always say yes. So thanks so for you having me. You don't get to that level of collecting without always <laughs> being ready to talk. I'm always ready. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so Mike, you're primarily on Instagram, right? Yes. Uh, I am I am a member of uh, a, a number of Alice Cooper Facebook groups, um, which, of course, is due to my collecting and just my fandom of Alice Cooper and, and wanting to kind of reach out and connect with uh, like-minded individuals. So I'm an admin for a couple, I'm a moderator for a couple, and then I'm just a member uh, of a few. And uh, it, that's been invaluable, really, for, for meeting people in the Alice Cooper uh, collecting community and just the music community. Um, and really helped my collection along, to be honest. Uh, you know, when you're, when you're a member of things like that, you, you really kind of, uh, you know, through, through trades and just kind of figuring out, uh, oh, there's a variant I didn't know about of a certain album. <laughs> you yeah. know, so if I know about things you didn't even absolutely. know existed sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But in terms of having my own uh, online presence, if you will, it's just, it's just through Instagram. And it's something I started, uh, on Instagram, I have been collecting for for many many years. It was kind of a COVID, kind of a COVID thing. I probably amped my collecting up a little bit during COVID because you couldn't do anything else. So the money that I'd normally be spending, perhaps at record stores, went to you know disc logs and eBay and online auctions and, and things of that nature. I know all about that. Uh, yeah. 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 So. Uh, so certainly, you know, my collecting started decades before that, but I, I really amped it up, I think, in probably 2019, 2020. Uh, and that's when I became online friends with uh, with a lot of Alice Cooper collectors and really, I guess, kind of took the next step into my, uh, you, you used the right word, Tim, addiction, or you said, uh, what was the word you said? earlier you said obsession or whatever that's that's what i'm yeah I'm it's somewhere somewhere in the I, middle right i mean we, I, I'm, we I'm definitely we just, afflicted. It's, a, it's a thing that happens right you just <laughs> yeah but you know i always say it could be worse it could be worse it could be it could worse, be worse no, that's, that's what i tell my wife when uh yeah when it, it was funny when when covid uh First, I'm I'm a graphic designer, illustrator. I work from home anyway. I'm, this is my studio, so uh, it's a bit of a shrine to Alice Cooper. But it's 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 tidy, it's tasteful, and it's uh, the main room in our house. When you come in, you know it it, it doubles as um, you know it's my office and studio, and also you know our kind of our dining room. Uh, you know if we have people over, um, but it's also during COVID was kind of where you worked. Um, my wife was sent home didn't have an office then anymore because of you know this the work from home policy so she got to share this room with me and that's when i really got busted because there were days where there was one day when the when the a delivery truck uh pulled up to the front of the house and the mailman got out with a bucket and there were 13 <laughs> <laughs> boxes in there of lps or seven inches and they all just kind of happened to arrive at the same time and she went oh okay so she didn't really have a clue to the level of the uh the addiction until she got to see it from uh, from working from home so but yeah you're right it's there's a there's worse things you could be spending it on for sure so um yeah it, 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 at alice cooper collector on instagram and i highly recommend uh following mike's page because i've learned so much and I, i'm fascinated by the variants and there's lots of you know alice cooper's just one artist that i am into and you know purchase the vinyl and a tracks and all the other things um but i mean i very few do i hone in on like that and so you know if i get a good decent copy of a vinyl uh you know one of alice's albums like, cool i've got this on vinyl or if i see a better one i'll upgrade it but you i mean you take it that step <laughs> further and i admire that and you know and among other things 
Um, Mike reached out to me when uh, someone was uh, selling uh, a copy of Special Forces on cassette on eBay, and he, he put me wise to it. Now it's not an official copy, but it's the only one I needed to fill up my collection. So I got it. So thanks for that. I, I, I hey. can still use a Warner Brothers copy, but that one, that seems to be very, very scarce. Yeah, the, the, it's funny. You get you, you know you get some releases, and certainly I think during those kind of lean Alice years, one of my favorite solo eras, really, were the uh, as blackout era, as it was known, from about eighty one Special Forces through to Dada, the end of the Warner years run. Um, that's actually one of the Facebook groups that uh, that I'm a co administrator on. Um, you know, Alice wasn't doing doing great. Physically or mentally, you know, that's why they were called the Blackout Years. There was uh, three of the four albums between 80 and 83 that he recorded. Um, he states having no recollection of, of recording, um, you know, writing the songs. Uh, he didn't tour uh, the last two of them. Zipper and Dada didn't get a tour at all. Didn't get any, uh, really any publicity from uh, Warner Brothers promotional department because they were kind of like, you're out of here, bud. This is your last album. And yeah, he was, uh, yeah. You know, he he after after that, after uh, 83's last, uh, you know, or Warner Brothers last 83 album, Dada, which is my favorite solo album, by the way, um, straightened himself up in terms of kicking, kicking the booze uh, and, the, and, the, and the drugs for good. So when he came back with uh, MCA Records in 86, on the, you know, with Constrictor and kind of got a bit more metal and everything. Um, not my favorite era, but first time I saw him live was during that era. So I have a soft spot for it. But. I guess my wheelhouse in terms of collecting is certainly that kind of 69 to 83. I call it the, the Warner Brothers year. Warner and then of Warner, course, anything, yeah. anything I can get my hands on pre Alice Cooper, no spiders, Nas, that kind of, those kind of things are always important as well. But certainly uh, Pretties for You to Dada is kind of my wheelhouse. So I have, I have a couple of copies of every other album, but I mean, I have 30 copies of Pretties for You. <laughs> I have 30 <laughs> wow. copies of Easy Action. You know, those first few, um, kind of major label uh, when they were going from straight to Warner Brothers, you know, you get an album like Love It to Death. When you look at all the different variants from the straight label over to the Warner Brothers label, how can you not have does it? You know, if you really want yeah. to collect variants, you're in, yeah. you're in, you're in for a world of hurt and financial trouble. If you're, uh, if you're looking to kind of do what I've done and that's try to get every country and then every label variant from, from every record label. <laughs> it's uh the labor of love and then you're constantly checking spreadsheets and, and and you know crossing things off but have you ever bought anything and realized you already had it yes okay. yes i have i've actually ordered things paid you know a lot of money to have them shipped to me and then when i'm going to you know because what i do is i i have a lot of things showing up from time to time uh you know, like I said, I, I work, so I get busy with real life too. I've got a wife and daughter and a job. Uh, so sometimes things will just, I'll put them on a shelf. And then when I get a chance, you know, on, uh, you know, every, every few weekends, maybe I'll, if I've got the house to myself, you know, I'll put on some music and I'll start cataloging and filing. And then I have, you know, little stickers that I'll put in the corner, you know, this is a 1971 uh, French pressing. And, and yes, that's when I then discover when I go to so put it in my shelf here that I'll, I'll pull it out and go, well, shit, I already got that one. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, sometimes then, sometimes I'll look at it and go, it's an upgrade. It's it's a near mint example. The other one was maybe a very good plus. So, I mean, nothing nothing goes to waste. And then you got something to use for a bit of trade bait. So There you go. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back a little bit, Mike. Um, when did you first, I guess, hear of Alice or become a fan? I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the, it's, it, yeah. the springboard is important. Absolutely. Uh, well, I was born in 73, so unfortunately did not get a chance to see the live band. They broke up weeks after I was born. <laughs> I don't know if I was bad luck or what, but, uh, but when I was, when I was uh, 11, it would have been around 84. So when I was around 11 years old, of course, I was into uh, you know, hard rock, heavy metal. Uh, I'm an 11 year old kid in the 80, in the mid eighties, you know, in, in 1984. So everyone's got Van Halen and and uh, you know Motley Crue, and uh, you know all, all the different bands, and and, yeah. and you were listening to those on tape, and and, and some albums. I got a sister who's four years older. I remember her, a boyfriend she was dating at the time left a uh, shout at the devil album over at my house. So I mean, I was getting exposed to kind of the the hard rock, heavy metal kind of um, typical bands that everybody was into. 
uh, there was a day I, I distinctly remember that uh, my best friend Gary and I at the time went over to our other friend Terry's house. And we were listening to music and um, he brought us into the basement and he found this trunk in the basement and it was his dad's stuff. And in there were some Playboy magazines, which was also cool for us at the time. But more importantly, there was a ton of vinyl in there. And we flipped through and two of the albums that were in there, the first two albums that we that I discovered that we then put on uh, was Welcome to My Nightmare, which I was struck by the artwork on the cover, you know, this guy in the top hat and this beautiful um, illustration with all the bugs and, and uh, uh, butterflies and, and, and whatnot around it. And the other one was Alice Cooper's Greatest Tits, um, which also that's a good, the that's cover a good struck one me. Too. That's a good, those, that's that's a good, a good one too, right? I mean, yeah. if you're gonna have a, if you're gonna have a good one too, and of course at the time I, did, I couldn't disting, uh, distinguish between band Alice Cooper and right. solo Alice Cooper. I was just discovering Alice Cooper. Uh, when we played them, they, they, they sounded different, but I loved them both. Like, you know, I could kind of tell them it was 1984. There was no internet. I remember uh, borrowing both albums and, and he said, yeah, sure. You know, my dad's got them down here in this. He, he won't notice that they're gone. So I went home with both those albums and, and listened to them over and over. And 1984, there's no internet. You can't really, you know, at your fingertips, you can't kind of uh, find out more about it. But I knew I knew I was in love with the music. Um, the one had this kind of spooky, you know, Vincent Price was on one. And, you know, this is, this is before Michael Jackson did it on Thriller. You know what I mean? Exactly. This was like, this was, and I, it was a scary movie. We watched Friday the 13th, my buddies and I. Like, we were horror movie fans, too. So to have this Vincent Price voice um, and a song called The Black Widow, and this album, you know, Welcome to My Nightmare, and kind of this concept throughout. And if you look at the, and listen to the back side of that, it's still one of my favorite kind of sides of an Alice Cooper album with that, um, you know, uh, you got some folks and you got, you know, Years Ago and Steven and The Awakening, and they all kind of flow together in this kind of real horror movie kind of. So I was struck right away with this, you know, um, spiders and horror and, and kind of scariness really, really spoke to me. The other one, it was just, I mean, School's Out and Under My Wheels and Desperado and every song on there, this greatest hits package, every song on there was just like I was floored. So I had to learn more uh, about them. So, you know, it was, I remember taking books out of the library, rock books on albums out of the library and uh, kind of doing it that way, the old fashioned way, right before. Yeah, it's hard uh, to describe to younger people just how hard it was before. Oh, my God. Because in I 1984, mean, you wouldn't have been reading about Alice and Hit Freighter and Circus either. It wouldn't have been. No, not at all. Not at all. A few years later, you did. When it came back yeah. with Constrictor, for sure, the Hit Freighters yeah. and the Creams and the magazines that I was still into, for sure, you were seeing a resurgence of him then with the uh, snakes and the... But yeah, I mean, it was it was uh, libraries. It was uh, word of mouth. It was, hey, have you heard this Alice Cooper? And then having someone go, yeah, yeah the early stuff is... What do you mean there? They were a band. Like it was just word of mouth with maybe some of the older kids on the block. I remember there was some kids, you know, four or five years older than us that were into Russian. I remember they had some Alice Cooper. And it really became, you know, you you educated yourself um, without the use of, you know, being able to just Google something now and find out the entire history and discography of the band. But certainly I remember taking out books on rock albums and and uh, even some Alice Cooper books, um, you know, that were that were in the music section of libraries. and. Uh, you kind of piece it together. Then, of course, you you know maybe buy a cassette, and then a lot of times there'd be also available on Warner Brothers cassettes. And yeah, get you a yeah. couple more albums, right? So yeah. it was like back to the store. You know, as soon as I get more money, I'm going to go back and buy this other one with the snake on the cover, Killer. And so you kind of then you know get to to kind of put them all together in order. And then, of course, when I heard uh, Pretty's for You and Easy oh. Action came out on cassette, and I oh it must be a new one. It wasn't. It was their first ones, and it sounded nothing like yeah. <laughs> Yeah, schooled out, you know, or billion dollar babies. It was like, where's the polish and what is this? At the time, it was kind of like, you know, what is this crap? Again, those two albums to me are just so near and dear to my heart now. Those those uh, first two straight label records on on Zappa's label, right? Where they're among my favorite. I mean, it's really hard for me to uh, to say they're my favorite because there's seven albums that the group did were just it's hard to pick a favorite child, but but certainly uh, they've they've all. Those ones have grown on me, and I just love the psychedelic nature of those of those first two. But yeah, that was that's kind of the uh, the story of discovering. It was weird, you know. I discovered the band and the man at the same time, but didn't know it until I kind of did my own Columbo work on it. 
Yeah, it's funny because so I'm, I'm a year, I'm just a year younger than you. We're around the same age. So I was born in 74. But honestly, I had never heard of Alice Cooper until um, He's Back came out on, on yeah. much music. I remember when I saw that video. Oh, um, for sure. Yeah. I, I don't even think I'd heard of I'd heard of Kiss. I mean, I knew who Kiss were, but I, I'd never heard of Alice Cooper. Now, I, I, think, I probably wouldn't have either if it wasn't for Terry's dad's trunk. Yeah. You know? Like it wasn't, he wasn't top of mind in 1984. That's for sure. I think I had heard Schools Out, but I had no idea who sang it. You know what I mean? This is yeah. one of those um, anthems. And, yeah. And I remember, um, I remember seeing the video for He's Back. Now, to, well, I was a long time before I got into Alice's music. Seriously, I was like a few songs here and there. Actually, it really, I'll be honest, it wasn't until um, it wasn't until the year 2000 uh, when I, I saw him at concert for the first of only two times. But yeah. that's another story. But I, I also remember um, much music, you know, they'd have backtracks, right? They'd show older videos. And I saw yeah. the video for How You Gonna See Me Now. And I was like, well, wait a second. I thought this guy was supposed to be like this heavy metal pioneer. <laughs> yeah, right? this, is, this isn't the least bit heavy. So... I think some of the magazines were a little bit lazy. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's funny because when, when I did eventually get into Alice, the closest comparison that I made to people, I said, it's kind of like getting into Queen because yeah. on a 10 song album, you're going to get at oh. least six or seven different styles of music. So don't expect oh, it to be metal to the metal all the way through. Yeah. It's going to be good and entertaining, but it's quite varied. That's that's. That's a great way to put it. That's a, that's a good analogy. I mean, if you did a mixtape or a mix CD and burn one, you know, to uh, for for the average uh, music listener who wasn't completely familiar with Alice Cooper's body of work, and yeah, you put on some psychedelic from Pretty's for You, and then you put on some classic, you know, anthems. I'm 18, schools out, and then you put on the ballad, the mid, you know, the mid seventies, yeah. mid to late seventies ballads, the, right? King of the silver screen, start, start throwing that yeah, stuff. Yeah, King of the silver screen. Well, starting with Only Women Bleed, right? And then yeah. it was I Never Cried. He was getting yeah. hit after hit with these radio friendly, soft ballads. And, uh, you know, maybe some of the hardcore Coop uh, fans that grew up with the band were not necessarily in line with that. They were maybe a little turned off. But as somebody who was kind of getting into it all, I loved the fact that it was, he's like a chameleon. You know, it was just whatever. I mean, even clones, right? Like he wanted to have that new wave kind of yeah. sound. And I mean, that sounds like the Cars meets Gary Newman, right? I exactly. mean, it's just such a, a such a cool song. But yeah, if you took some of that material and then put it with uh, a new wave number, and then put it with some of these ballads, and then threw and then tapped it off with with Brutal Planet, uh, this kind of industrial rock kind of you know that was popular around that time, you'd be like, what is you know? It, schizophrenic I mean, you know I, thought, was, yeah, was, I, I told you to make me an alice cooper mix i just did maybe like these can't <laughs> totally. all be these can't all be the same you know exactly entity or whatever yeah um yeah. no it's it's pretty cool and you know i i've said this he, he sold a lot of albums but not and not nearly enough like i, I think there's too many people that know who he is but the, the albums don't even even in that period in the mid to late 70s where he was having you know, these top 20 singles with these ballads, but the albums weren't selling along with them. It, like, it's just yeah. crazy that there's this gap between, um, oh, absolutely. You know, goes, goes to hell and trash before he, ha you know, he didn't have anything certified in the States. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of that was perhaps the, um, you know, his, his drinking for sure through some of those tours, even, I mean, if you went to see him on the King of the Silver screen tour in 1977, before he went into rehab the first time and, and, I've seen reviews on some of those uh, shows, not the greatest shows. Um, you know, he, he, he was not in great shape, right? So as much as those albums were really good, you know, perhaps the tours weren't. And then because of how the shape he was in, perhaps like, I think the management, uh, the, you know, the promotional departments at Warner Brothers probably, you know, it, it, it waned a little bit. And certainly we, we know the Blackout albums were um, not promoted at all. No, but and I love right. that I mean, they were the too. biggest. I'm a big, I'm, big yeah, fan absolutely. But I mean, they were the biggest band on the planet in 1973, right? Billion yes. Dollar Babies just had its 50th anniversary, and I mean, um, they were they were they were it, right? They were they were setting indoor attendance records or you know concert ticket sales for for tours that the Rolling Stones had previously held. Um, just the biggest band on the planet, and uh, you know, I read tons of interviews and, and and books on the toll that took on the band and of course that's why it ended up uh 
it was a permanent hiatus, unfortunately, um, which saw, you know, Bob and Shep and the powers that be kind of go with Alice and, and, and kind of yeah. follow that train. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there's also a whole ton of fans out there. And, and again, it's, it's, there's some people who will reach out to me and go, I didn't know any of this stuff existed. Like they'll follow me because they perhaps were mid eighties, you know, constrictor, raise your fist and yell. Yeah. Into the nineties, they were fans of those, you know, they're, they're heavy metal fans. Right. And I'll post something and they'll go, I didn't even know about half this band stuff until I started following you on, on Instagram. I, I, I guess I kind of, they thought it kind of started in 1986 with, with, you know, the, the heavy metal. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And trash and hey stupid and yeah 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 the hair the hair metal and the, and the trash metal you know thrash metal yeah and the trouble is is that you know most of his you know everything he's put out pretty much in the 2000s um they haven't been on big labels and yeah. sometimes it's a different label each time so you can't it's hard to find you know some of the stuff yeah. uh and it doesn't get promoted correctly it's it's just a shame but you know something the fact that he just keeps doing it is oh man inspired to me like he just doesn't stop putting out albums and, and, and something absolutely i mean 28 28 studio albums all together and, and a slew of others and we talked about some of those shows in the mid to late 70s where he started to kind of put on less than great performances i mean i've seen him as recently as last year and he's just there's nobody else there's nobody else that still and he's 75 years old right there's nobody else that still puts on that kind of show you got two hours of pure even if you've seen it and know what's coming, right? I've, I've been on tours where I've seen him twice in a week in two different cities. I know what he's going to do, but he still puts on such a fantastic show. The backing band is always fantastic. That's always been the case, right? Even in the seventies with Hunter yep. and Wagner and, you know, yep. the, he's always surrounded himself with fantastic musicians, but his current lineup that's been with him for, you know, for quite a while now is, is just a plus at what they do. And the entertainment value is just you know, bar none, the cast of characters and his wife and daughter still touring with him and you know, dancing on stage and really kind of a family affair. It's really good to see. He's, uh, his voice and his showmanship, I think, is as, as good as it's ever been, if not better. So that brings me to my next question because I'll, 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 my Alice Cooper live experience is pretty limited. I saw him in 2000 uh, in Portland, Maine on Brutal Planet. Now, my friend Matt and I, Matt's been on my show plenty of times. He's kind of the guy that introduced me to more of Alice's stuff. Um, it was a one-two punch of a Brutal Planet that just come out. Now, I'm not normally into the new metal stuff, but for some reason, I was really curious about Brutal Planet. So I listened to that a lot. And he also played me Love It to Death. And I that's that's my favorite of the band albums by far. Uh, so I listened yeah. to those two. And the, the fortunate thing was I was in Columbia House at the time, and they were having a sale on their box sets. So I got The Life and Crimes of Alice Cooper, which I still think is one of the best box sets ever put out. And I just realized the breadth of his work. Then we find out he's coming somewhat close to the area. And we actually ran into him uh, crossing the street from one record store to another. He was coming out, but he was like obviously incognito. And it was just like, Alice, Alice, hey, hey. And it was, we just kind of stood there like, what just happened? And it's like, well, we didn't want to go tag the guy, right? But like, but uh but the cool thing was that we did meet Eric Singer a little bit later. That was oh, nice. that was cool because we're both Kiss fans too. And, yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah, for sure. So, so and it was a fantastic show. And when the brutally live uh, video came out, it yeah. was like getting to watch it all over again. It was a different venue, but it was the same show. And yeah. uh, I just things came back to me. Oh yeah, they did that. And then during this song, they did that. And he had a great band. Then. So I was, also saw him on uh, Dirty Diamonds tour in uh, two thousand six. Okay. That's with good. Helix opening, which was great. So I love yeah. Helix too. Good, so that good Canadian great. band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what is your concert history going back with Alice? Uh, well, I discovered him in about 84-ish, like I said. Um, he actually, when when uh, Constructor came out, and again, you know, he's back in Teenage Frankenstein and all the songs that were in my favorite movie franchise, Friday the 13th, which was another, my worlds collided. I was a huge Jason Voorhees fan. And then here we are with part six comes out. And there's not one, not two, but three Alice Cooper songs represented in there. Um, so not long uh, after that, Constrictor, you know, was was on the shelves, and of course, I uh, I didn't I didn't love it as much as I loved the rest of the music that I accumulated. But I was happy he was back. I was happy he was 
on the radio again and, and hopefully going to be touring. And then uh, finally, I was in St. John's, Newfoundland at the time. Uh, finally, in uh, 1988, uh, he ended up coming to town, uh, played uh, Memorial Stadium in downtown St. John's. Um, I ended up at that show, Motorhead opened, their first and only appearance in, uh, in Newfoundland. So, I mean, it was just... It was just so cool to be able, I mean, I couldn't hear for a week because Motorhead was truly the yeah. last. But Motorhead opened, um, uh, Alice Cooper, um, you know, hung himself at the end. It was just, you know, it was it was a spectacle. It was like, you don't know what to expect other than you're seeing this performer that you really love for the first time. So you're kind of like starstruck. But again, I just, uh, I can close my eyes and still picture where I was and the angle I saw it at. Um, it, it, it blew my mind. And again, the mock, the mock execution, which of course I've seen them enough times now to see different kind of uh, things happen on stage and all kinds of different, uh, you know, things, you know, play out. But yeah, that, that first show I'll, I'll never forget. Um, and it, from that time on, any, any chance I can see him, um, I've seen him. You know, like I said, I've been in Calgary now for 30 years. I've seen him every time he's come through town. I've traveled to some other places around here and seen him at other even a few years ago maybe five or you know maybe 10 years ago now um he did a a tour around canada of just small venues and there was just like tiny i don't even remember the name of the town now, but there was one in saskatchewan that was at their community like at their little hockey rink i mean the place holds a thousand people and he put on a show there so i mean of course i went it was unbelievable you know just to see him it was almost like what I would imagine, like seeing them in the early band days when they were just playing, playing, you know, you know, venues, but not, you know, not Mad not Madison Square Garden type of venues. So uh, yeah, I've, I think I've seen them. I, I've I've lost track of the times, but what you know, well over twenty for sure. Um, you know, 20, 25 times. Um, I had tickets last time he he came through. Um, been lucky enough to meet him three times. Um, that was, that was my next question. Ask if you yeah, that. didn't didn't bump into him, but I did pay to see him uh, three different times at at meet and greets. Um, the first time I saw him was on the um, two thousand eight, so it would have been a long time of spider yeah. uh, here in Calgary at a great venue with just uh, the um, the uh, Southern Alberta Jubilee Auditorium. So just a really a smaller venue, really like good acoustics. And I was in row three, I bought the VIP seats. So you were guaranteed row three or better. So I was pretty close to the stage um, and had a meet and greet, which they used to do after the show, which was great because you got all excited from the show and then got to meet him. Um, about four songs in, he pulls out a cane, starts whipping it around and threw it out into the crowd. And I put up my hand and as soon as, and there, you know, 10 other people did too, but I put up my hand and I had a grip of it and it was just covered in hands. And I just wrestled, I wrestled like 10 people. I, I had my hand on, I had my <laughs> hand on a cane in St. John in 2006, but the guy on the other end of it, he wasn't let go. He looked mad. I'm like, you know what? I'm not getting beat up. I want to see the show, but yeah. I, That's probably I, what, I almost, that's probably I what almost I looked got like, a, I almost got his cane. Yeah. Well, it was uh, it was going to be mine because again, I knew that you know in two hours I was going to be in a in a room backstage, and so this is one of the items I'm going to get signed. Uh, so that was a a stage used cane that came straight from uh, from Coop's hand to mine, and then was you know signed two hours later. So that's one of the items here that I that I pulled out to do a bit of a show and tell uh, awesome. on on uh, you know just something that is sentimentally you know really important to me. I've met so, him a couple of other times as well and got other things autographed, but this was the first thing I've ever gotten autographed. So it's uh, pretty special. That is so cool. Um, so when, is, when did you realize that, did it kind of sneak up on you that you had started to amass quite a collection of Alice stuff? Like, um, yeah. and did you collect other artists this way? Or did you just I start I, collecting Alice? I don't collect... Um, I don't collect other artists this way. I mean, I have, I love Judas Priest and I have everything from in the, in my favorite wheelhouse of Judas Priest, you know, rock and roll at a kind of um, screaming for vengeance. I got one or two copies of each of those, maybe, maybe a Japanese pressing of some of my favorites to get the OVI strip on it or whatever. 
you know, I got lots of Sabbath. I've got, you know, plenty of other hundreds of other albums, but there's nothing where I have this, this amount. And yeah, as I started to, cause I do have to keep track. I do have to note because, so I don't buy things and especially something like, you know, seven inch singles. That's one of the things that I really uh, concentrate on, of course, because there are just so many. And the picture sleeves are beautiful. Different yeah. countries had, had, had picture sleeves that were only for their country. So, you know, you get a country like Turkey. I'm like, they've, there's only four or five Alice Cooper albums, uh, your uh, seven inches from Turkey, but the artwork is stunning. So you got to collect all those. Um, you know, Germany, France, like you name it. So I, I had to start amassing a bit of a, you know, spreadsheet almost. Um, and that's when you really start to realize how many you have. Like I've got, you know, 66 from, you know, Yugoslavia. Like it's just, you know, it, it gets it gets nuts when you kind of look at how many you have. Um, and, and it's and it's a lot. You know, I got a, about 600 singles from 31 different countries. For LPs, you know, I've got, 700 more than 700 um and again most of those are from 1969 to 83 right because like i said from constrictor on i've got one or two copy nice copies of uh of those but you know i got 30 you know between 20 and 30 of kind of every one from 69 to, to, to 83 adds up what uh, so, so what album what what album do you have the most copies of in, in any format uh it's a tie between Pretties for You and Easy Action, actually, uh, in terms of having LP copies. Now, I think the reason for that might be just the sheer number of variants because of straight records and then Warner Brothers. The changeover to Warner. Yeah. So, like, you know, I've got the promos and stock copy of, you know, first pressing promo and then a second pressing and then the third pressing promo. And, you know, you get, you start to get into that and you got a couple, you know, I've got five, five first pressings, you know, like just because you can't have enough. Like it's my favorite, you know, label, the orange label. In fact, the, the first straight label, uh, Pretty For You straight label is a label that only that artist ever had. They changed the straight label design after that came out. So there's literally no other artist in the world that has the orange label with the purple straight letters in an arc, right? So it's just things like that, that, that uh, you know, you, I got to have a few copies of that. And then when they changed over to the repeated stepped, you know, new straight label, there's, you know, there's just different pressings. And then of course there's, um, you know, for Pretties For You, it was available on, on straight in Canada and in France and in Germany. And Germany had different labels that were pink and black and white and with the repeated logo. So there's just different, there's just so many variants. And then you get into the, the, the Warner years and then you've got the olive green and then you've got the Burbank and then you've got the Burbank with the Wii logo, and then you've got the, you know, green label with the straight label still on it, and then the green label with just the Warner Brothers shield and no straight label on it, or logo on it. I, I know I'm ridiculous, but I got to have no, no, every one of those so I can say I can Of course, you've them. got the, the, the cover <laughs> variants, right? Cover variants, some have, the, some have the sticker, some have the, you know, the sticker removed, some never had the sticker. I've got, you know, some countries that had the... Uh, the you know the illustration on the front in which the woman is lifting her skirt and you can see the panties like shocking right but it had to be censored for some of them it's a box that's printed over top so I wanted to make sure that I got each of the correct uh, cover to go with each of the correct variants so it it quickly gets out of hand and I'm I'm pretty close now there's one um, promo uh, copy uh, uh, a Warner Brothers Seven Arts record. Uh, white label promo that I'm missing for pretties for you. And that's about it. When I, when I can cross that one off my list, I'm probably done with, uh, with easy, with uh, pretties for you, easy action, same thing. So many different straight labels. And then when it got into uh, Warner brothers, again, the first Canadian Warner brothers is a gold label. Um, very, really hard to come by. Even here in Canada, I don't see them very often. I'm on the lookout for my friend, Chris, uh, <laughs> <laughs> in the UK to see if I can send them one. So I'm still on that, Chris. But you get into, again, all the different label variations of uh, of all of labels and, and Burbank labels and everything else. And before you know it, yeah, I've got 30 of each of those. Uh, but I've got, you know, over 20, uh, over 20 of the rest for sure. I've got, you know, uh, 11 different first pressings of schools out that all have the panties in different colors. Um, you know, I've got, as as many or more billion dollar babies that all have the bank note in different countries, you know, uh, pressings with the uh, with inserts and and I have a massive Japanese collection. That was one uh, one of the things over the last couple of years 
um, that I really concentrated on. Uh, my goal was to get a promo and stock, at least a promo and stock copy of, of every single um, available Japanese LP re release from, from Love It to Death to uh, Raise Your Fist and Yell. And I'm, I'm one away on that too. I'm a killer blue label promo away from having all those. So there's, there's collections within the collections. You know, yeah. And there's weeks and months that I'll say, I'm going to concentrate on filling some holes in my, in my singles collection now because that's kind of inexpensive to do. A lot of the ones I need are just fillers. They're just, they're just uh, variants that you can pick up for 10, 20 bucks. And then sometimes I'll go like, okay, I'm going to get onto the Japanese train right now and try to get those last 10 I need. Or So it all depends on uh, phase of the moon and how much cash I want to spend. <laughs> It's funny. It doesn't seem to matter who people collect. Everybody seems to say the same, say the same thing. There's something special about those Japanese pressings. You get the Obi strip and you get the yeah. extra, the, 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 the extra lyric time, insert. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it doesn't they're, take they're, Once you start to figure out, okay, well, you know, love it to death, for instance, not only have you got straight changing over to Warner, some have the banner on them, some have the finger on them, Oh, so absolutely. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great point. Cover The cover variance is where it's at for Love It to Death, for sure. There were so many, uh, you know, there was the, the, the original in some countries, um, you know, had the original foam cover. Some, by the time they did their first pressing in a certain country, it had, al or had already been dealt with. One form or the other of kind of um, censoring it had happened. Um, but yeah, different, different countries at different times had different methods of, of what they were going to do. There's somewhere it's a cropped image on the top and the bottom. So you only see the boys from kind of the waist up. That was the, the cheap and uh, easy way to kind of, and then it was, uh, you know, airbrush it out or, you know, just kind of black it out. And, uh, there's some that have the full arm covered up with the cape and some with just the hand. And it looks kind of weird because it looks like his hand had just been cut off. So there, there were, you know, a number, a half dozen for sure, uh, different kind of cover variants on how to treat that uh, thumb. And of course now reissues, they're like, with, with the reissues now, you know, Rhino or something, I'll put out a reissue. It's just the album as it was in terms of yeah. the cover art, because I mean, let's be real. It only ever looked like a thumb to me anyway. It was kind of ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you know, it's so funny that in the, you know, earlier days around the world, there were no, like, nowadays a record company would make sure that they had someone on hand in every country say, it has to look like this, it has to be so but they just, it's, it's like each country was on their own as far as what they were doing. Like sometimes they'd put yeah. an album out with, I've seen some Kiss ones like that. I've seen versions of Hotter Than Hell that has like an animated cover on it. Like just makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, but That's what makes the collecting absolutely. thing really stand out. You know, I guess that, uh, any any press is good press too, right? And I mean, uh, back in the day when, when during the group years, for sure they had Shep Gordon in their corner kind of causing as much, and not, nothing yeah. to do with the love of the death, but with, with the schools out, you know. I mean, there's stories of the paper panties getting put on those albums and then Shep calling, calling up and saying, they're a fire hazard just to kind of get. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. The, he the you know, so anything. Shep, oh, Shep got my God. It. Anything right from the beginning. Anything, he was the ultimate uh, marketing uh, genius. So anything he could do to kind of get them, you know, in the press for either good or bad reasons, he was, he was going to do it. So uh, while we're on that subject, uh, my buddy Matt wanted me to ask, what would it cost someone to get a good, a really good copy of schools out with all the inserts? Uh, just a U.S. press? U.S., Canadian. You know, okay. just as long as everything. Um, I mean, yeah, with with the with the uh, it it's really tough to get everything in it. Um, you know, I've got I've got this. Uh, this is my Canadian. This is one of my schools out. This is a Canadian schools out. Sorry about the glare. This was the other thing that I took when I met him in two thousand eight to have signed. I as I carefully took the panties off my uh, Canadian first pressing. And, uh, and brought it in and he actually, uh, he signed the, the panties on that. But I mean, finding them with, finding them with the panties is not, you know, it's a couple, you know, people are charging way too much for them. Uh, actually, you go on eBay and, and uh, Discogs and places like that. And, you know, it'll say with panties and then it'll be you know, 200 euros. And it's like, it's the panties themselves are not that hard to find. Um, it's the, the report card, the hall pass, those types of things that came with the very early uh, copies, you just don't find them. Uh, you will sometimes find them with a report card um, in them. 
but I believe the very early copies came with the, the report card, you know, the panties, obviously, but the report card and the hall pass, I might be mistaken. The, um, these are a couple of press kits. One of the things that I'm really into uh, and have been for a number of years, and it's kind of, again, I spoke about that collection within the collection, is the press kits. So these are the schools out press kits. If you want to get everything, you want to get your hands on one of these. But again, yeah. these don't pop up too often. I, I happen, I'm lucky enough to have two, a U.S. and a German version. Um, is and it cheaper sometimes to buy like two or three uh, with various states of completeness and just kind of Frankenstein them together? That's what I did for when I bought my U.S. When I bought my U.S. version, uh, it came with some elements of a German press kit. It had the say, it had the media bio sheet. It had a few of the things. The photos were stamped in German rather than English, so it came with the kind of one and a half press kits, a full U.S. and then about a half a German. And then I pieced together the rest of the German pieces enough to be able to. I got the temporary tattoo, a second one of those. Got a second hall pass. Got a second. Um, um, uh, report card and managed to kind of hobble together where I have, you know, a complete U S and a complete German now, but certainly you can go at it that way. But for your, to answer your friend's question, really tough to find. I just don't see them. I mean, I I'm, I'm constantly, I spend uh, more time per day than I care uh, just browsing the internet, just making sure that I'm not missing out on anything in terms of especially press kit materials um, to look at, you know, uh, a school's out with, with all the, um, it'd be five, 600 bucks probably. If you were to ever find one that had, that was in mint or near mint condition that had the fold out, not folded out and, and ruined like a lot of the desk feet on the back of the album can be torn or missing. If you had that in great shape and then a near mint example of the album with the original underwear still on it. And then you happen to find the two pieces of, uh, of paper, the, the hall pass and the report card. I think that an, a seller would be able to kind of put it in an auction on eBay and, they'd be pleasantly surprised with what they'd get for it. Wow. Yeah. Which brings me to the question that I had, and, and people are sitting there knowing that I'm going to ask this question. Um, it's about <laughs> 8-tracks. And I know you've got a lot of Alice Cooper albums on 8-track. And not counting the um, Live at the AstroTurf from a yes. few years ago. Um, was Special I thought, Force... I thought you might ask, Tim. I, yeah, I thought you might ask. So what, cool. what, what, that is so I thought cool. you might ask what the last one was. And I was going to say yeah. kind of a trick question. The last yeah. one, and, and it's probably so, your next question. Is that so the, before that one, not counting that one. Yeah. The only, the last one I've ever seen is special forces. You got it. Yeah. So, that is correct. so to your knowledge, there isn't one for zipper. To my, to my knowledge, now there could be a viewer out there that's going to watch this and, and take a uh, um, issue with that. At one point, uh, several years ago, I remember, um having this discussion online and somebody saying there was zipper zipper catch of skin um was was on, available on eight track and then a few other people chimed in and went no and there was you know not an argument that was kind of like no i know i've seen it and there was even at one point a discogs entry an yes. entry in a database nobody owned it but it was an entry of database for zipper catch of skin but there's no photo yeah, see, that's yeah, and it's, and it's down, and you yeah. can't find it now. If you do a filter yeah. and try to look for Alice Cooper eight tracks, type in Zipper Catch a Skin, it says can't find anything. I've been uh, I've been collecting long enough that somebody would have put one on one of the Facebook groups. Especially, I'm an admin for an eighty to eighty four, like the Blackout Years uh, Facebook group. I got collector friends from all over the world who have as much or more than I than I have in 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 Germany and in England and in you know all, Australia, all over the world. Somebody would have posted one of those and said, look what I got. That's, that's <laughs> what I tend to think. And I, I yeah, yeah, because I've got flush the fashion. Um, that's the only one of the black eight years ones that I have. And I, I, I've been looking for special forces. I don't care if it's an RCA music service version, but yeah, I, I know that, I know that um, I know way too much about eight tracks, you know, right. I wrote a book about it, but um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, Warner brothers, was just one of many labels. They were still putting out eight tracks in 1982. You can get um, you can get yeah. Van Halen Diver Down, or you can yeah. get um, you know different. I think ones. that's why a lot of people perhaps thought that it was, or somebody was. Yeah, because you're and, right. And, there are albums into yeah. that 82, almost even up to close to 83. Well, you can there get, were you some, can but a, you can get a retail version of Def Leppard Pyromania. That's the last known one. That's yeah. January 20th, 83, uh, on yeah. Mercury. 
so yeah there but after that um of course it's just the the record clubs but um yeah the 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 things that the people have to and i've had this discussion with people too well somebody will swear up and down there i remember seeing it it's like that's nice i need a picture you know yeah. i'm a skeptic when it, i need a, i need it and i need a good picture and don't just post yeah. a photo of the album yeah i want i want i want to know how the tracks are broken up i want to know exactly uh, I want to see the barcode. I, you know, I want to, you know, I, I, I need to know that it, you know, I'm not going to say it exists <laughs> until I see it, you know? And the, yeah. the, the problem is that this, it's unique because in Alice's case, because um, a lot of people are always surprised to, you know, even now to find it, even though I've blathered on about it for, I don't know how long that the record clubs made certain titles available all the way up through 1988. But you have to consider that at the time Alice was selling, I mean, Warner brothers was probably, making so few copies of the record right like we both mentioned yeah. it's hard to find special forces on cassette imagine how hard it is to find it on a track so why are they going to bother you know if they're th thinking yeah. about doing away with the format for retail they're probably you know zipper catch skin is not going to be on their priority list we got to make sure that's yeah. on a track um and by that's the time that, that data came out it sold so poorly that it they you know, Warner Brothers wouldn't have seen any use in licensing it to Columbia House or RC Music Service. Now, the one Absolutely. question mark that I have, and and um, and it's one of those things where you can never say never because next thing you know, here it is. But um, the one sort of dangling question is Constrictor. And the reason I say that is because Boston Third Stage came out on 8-track through the record clubs, Kansas Power came out on 8-Track through the record clubs. Those were both MCA releases. Wouldn't surprise me at all to find out that Constrictor exists as an RCO. But like you said, you'd think we'd have seen it by now. But yeah. when you're getting into those later RCOs, we're talking about quantities that were so small, like probably, you know, I've had the conversation with people too, where it's just because something was listed in a Columbia House catalog from 1986 that you could order on 8-Track uh, doesn't mean that anybody did order it doesn't mean that they ran any off so yeah but that's exactly. the one that's the one you know post special forces album that wouldn't surprise me to find out exists on a track other yeah. than of course I, the astro Turf. yeah i i agree with that I, and, and i think you're bang on i mean you, you're right there is no way that uh, that albums like uh, zipper catch a skin or data were going to be any that if they did have a short list of albums that were going to get put you know to that format it was not going to be those they didn't do anything to promote those albums in vinyl format why would they you know they, yeah. they, they literally didn't do anything i mean and the thing is like you look at the the, uh, the press kits i was talking about you know all the way up through you know killer these i won't open them up because it's it's tough to but you know anybody who wants to see the insides of what all these press kits look like and uh, look at my instagram i've got full press kits for killer for for uh billion dollar babies a great one for a recent one for a muscle of love um and then the solo, you know, the, the Welcome to My Nightmare, the uh, Goes to Hell, a beautiful one from the inside. You know, these are all, this is a straight jacket that opens up like a straight jacket. It's got all the publicity, you know, the, the letters from, you know, Coop and, and Shep are, are written on letters that look like they have a Rorschach. So, I mean, it's just every, the publicity department at, at uh, Warner Brothers, even up to 1980, it was a little less, but it was kind of putting this, uh, you know, flush the fashion. AC 1980 paper bag, right? Yeah, it's minimalist, like like stripped down like the album. But you look at at all these, whether they're band or solo years, um, they really put everything into not just the packaging, but the hoopla surrounding it, the press, you know, the materials, the stickers, and the buttons, and the pop ups, and the, all the different, you know, schools out is you know probably the one that is the most over the top that has. But you get into the 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 years of of uh, special forces had a couple couple promo picks and then a lab, media bio that said top secret on it and that was it. Then you get into zipper and it was one one press pick that didn't even look like him and just the the media bio sheet. Then you get into Dada, same thing. It was just one one shot, you know, one headshot of him with a with a weird mullet because I think he was kind of getting ready for his monster dog performance or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, and then a, a, a one pager from, they didn't do anything to promote him. Um, you know, so I, I'm not surprised they were available in, in, in less formats, but like I said, my, 
my favorite, one of my favorite eras and my favorite solo, like I said, at the outset, my favorite solo album is, is Dada. You know, like it, I, it truly is just a, it's, it's, there's something about it. It's dark and mysterious. And the fact that the songs, maybe, maybe the fact that the songs have never been played live almost makes it more special to me. Yeah. Because when I put my earbuds in and I listen to it on my walk or, I'm, you know, it's like no one's heard these, but me is kind of the, the feeling that you get. I, I, I kind of don't want him to revisit it. He talked about, you know, those albums are kind of cool. Maybe I should, and I'm sure he won't, he's got new material. He's not going to revisit those. But I know some fans go, man, how awesome would that be if he re-recorded Dada? And I'm like, leave Dada alone. Oh, don't re-record. No, if any, do a song or two live. Don't re-record. It doesn't need to be recorded. You couldn't recapture the... I've no. said this before. That's possibly his scariest album. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. But, and I think he'd, by the time, he'd concur like, with that. By the time that, you know, especially Zipper and Dada came out, it's almost like Warner Brothers were doing the absolute bare minimum because it was cheaper to put the albums out and bury them than to get him out of this long-term contract. That's, that's the reason I think some, a lot of these bands from the seventies, uh, cheap tricks, an example that comes to mind where they had so many albums that didn't sell very well because they signed a contract and they had to honor it. So that's why I think you have, you know, the albums went into the eighties as far as they did, but um, I'm a big fan of those lost great albums and flush the fashion is probably my favorite of them, but, I mean, songs like Pain. I mean, those are just great. Yes, pain, great pain is one of my, yeah, Pain's one of my top 10 solo songs. You know, people ask me, people ask me so much through my, my Instagram, my Alice Cooper Collector Instagram account. I get so many people that will just DM me and say, um, what do you think of this album? Like, and which is great. I love interacting with other music fans and other yep. Alice Cooper fans. And just yesterday I had somebody say, uh, what's your favorite solo album? Because theirs was one. Welcome to my or uh, from from the inside. They said that's number two for me. And they, what's number one? Dada. And then oh, that's that's probably my one or two as well. And then what's your third? Like it was this back and forth conversation, just DMing through Instagram, and I just loved it, you know. And finally, I ended up just sharing all my entire rankings, like twenty one albums, <laughs> you know, solo albums, uh, all the way through. And he was, you know, I I agree with most of that. I may swap those, but you know, thanks for sharing. So there's. I've got lists on uh, on my devices in case anybody ever asks me, you know, rank your albums or what do you think of that one? And I've got same done for songs for both band and solo. And, and that's, Pain is that's a lot Pain's of one of my top 10. That's a lot of material, right? That's yeah. 28 albums worth. But yeah, you're right. Pain is a, uh, is a uh, well, I first fantastic. heard that on the box set and I remember thinking, wow, like, yeah, that's just good. That's just good yeah. songwriting. Like, it is and, and kind of and kind of dark on an otherwise kind of not really dark album. It's kind of dark and it's kind of funny at the same yeah. time. Like it, it, it's quintessential. Absolutely. Alice as as how he what it remind, you know what it reminded me of? I, when, I've had this conversation about pain before that that song almost reminded me like the, the, the newer wave 1980 version of inmates were all crazy. Bit of that dark humor in there right yeah you talk about even the part where um you know in in inmates he talks about we dug up the the, the graves where your relatives lay you know it's not like we were doing something wrong we just dug up the grave where your relatives are in pain it's you know um he's talking about i'm the i'm the dirtiest word at the vandalized grave yeah like there's some it, real like it, it's very descriptive like it's yeah, yeah. And, it, and in not a lot of words i just love plus the fashion it's just a, such a such a quirky uh, i mean all yeah. that's all those albums are quirky but um so what would be mike your both your prized possessions that are in your collection stuff you just can't believe you found and what are some things that your holy grails that are still out there that, you know, that are just you know that kind of haunt you like boy if i could absolutely ever get those. i've got um i pulled a couple of things off my wall in terms of holy grails a couple of seven inches uh that i have framed up on the wall this is one of them. This is definitely a, a holy grail for, for Alice Cooper collectors. So this is the 1966 uh, Santa Cruz Records original Spiders 7-inch. Um, so they were the earwigs, then they were the Spiders, then they were the Naz, then they were Alice Cooper, right? So uh, when they were still the Spiders, they had uh, a number two hit in, uh, in Phoenix with Don't Blow Your Mind. Don't Blow Your um, Mind, yeah. Don't Blow Your Mind. And it was backed with uh, No Price Tag. And just both fantastic songs um, for anybody out there who hasn't, you know, just just YouTube those or Google them, or uh, I believe they were available on the Life and Crimes box. Uh, as well. 
Uh, don't, don't blow, blow your, your mind. mind is, I don't think no price tag was, but I could be wrong. Yeah. With that. I know don't blow your mind is because I can think of how that one goes right off the top of my head. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's and, one and of my again, holy grails. People wouldn't know that was Alice Cooper. No, not at all. Not at all. They, you know, they got their, uh, you know, they, they had a lot of influences, but they were huge Beatles fans first and foremost, right? I yep. mean, when, uh, when they did their first kind of uh, talent show at the Letterman Club and lip synced along, they were the earwigs and they had, you know, wigs on, you know, to, to emulate the Beatles. And that's why they called yeah. themselves the earwigs. So they were big John and Paul fans and, and the Beatles. And, and, and then, you know, from then on, it was uh, a lot of the bands they were opening up for to the IP club, the Yardbirds and the, you know, like, so they were, so yeah, anybody who hears these early songs will definitely not go like, oh my God, that's Alice Cooper. You can tell after you listen to it, that that's tells Vince's you. voice, yeah. that's Vince's voice. But I, you know, the way he's singing, it, I never would have put it together that, you know, six years later, like when, you hear those early, dead babies. Uh, <laughs> when you hear that Steven Tyler, you know, uh, song and the chain reaction, but when I needed you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that's from 66. Same idea. It's like, Absolutely. Well, what is that? Is that the Trogs? Is that, who is that? Oh, <laughs> totally. <that> Steven Tyler. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's one of, that's one of my holy grails. And I think what, um, kind of known as one of the three albums in the, in the Holy Trinity of Alice Cooper collecting. Uh, the other one being the other spider single um, hitchhike, yeah. um, which is again, like really, you know, it was on mascot records. I've got plenty of reproductions of that one, but uh, you know, you'll never come across the, the original for that one. And then the third one uh, in the Holy Trinity would be their only single as the Nav, which would have been from 1967. And that would have been uh, Lay Down and Die Goodbye, not the version that was on Easy Action. For Easy Action, they reworked that song in a really long, long drawn out psychedelic version of it. But they got a short, punchy lyric version of Don't Blow Your Mind as the Naz. That's actually my, my favorite of the two versions. And it was backed with, um, well, that might have been the B side. The other side was uh, Wonder Who's Loving Her Now, which is one of my favorite. If you haven't heard that one, look that one up as well. Wonder Who's Loving Her Now by the Naz. Uh, and it's one of my early favorite um, free Alice Cooper uh, as well. But you, you wouldn't know it was uh, Alice and the Boys. Another one I pulled off my wall um, that is a holy grail for me and, and pretty rare is uh, Shoe Salesman, backed with Return of the Spider. So this would have been uh, the only single uh, off 1970s Easy Action. Um, Comes in a white label promo as well, but this is the stock copy on the uh, colored straight label. You don't see these very often. One came up for sale in late 2022, just a few months ago. Um, and I bought it for myself for Christmas. I just, you know, it was more money than I wanted to spend, but uh, it was one of those things where, am I gonna get another crack at owning one of those? And even some of the other collector friends that I have kind of said it's a lot of money, but you know what? you may never get another chance at an yeah. item like that. They just come around so infrequently that, and I always say to people when they go like, you spent how much on what? I always go, if I liked money more than I liked Alice Cooper albums, I would just have a whole room full of money and not this great collection. I get joy hey, out buddy. of this. Yeah. And like we said at the outset, I could, I could be spending that on a lot worse things. So um, it is what it is. I pulled out a few other things. We talked about music, you know, I've got, uh, probably 108 tracks and 100 cassettes and 100 CD. You know, I just got boxes and boxes of different variants. And the uh, the 600 plus LPs and the 500, 600 plus uh, uh, seven inches. But the, the other thing that I have quite a bit of is print materials. So, you know, uh, posters, uh, prints, clippings, ads, uh, handbills, uh, tour programs, photos tickets, things like that. So I pulled a couple of my absolute uh, favorite or things that I cherish the most. So this is a 19, March 1968 uh, ticket for the uh, Earl Warren Playground at in Santa Barbara. And they are opening up for uh, Blue Cheer. There's a, three bands on the bill. Blue Cheer was the headliner and opened it up was the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band long before they were fishing in the dark. They wow. were this kind of okay. weird, weird pinstripe suit, you know, yeah. outfit that was, you know, with the jug, kind of psychedelic country-ish. And the third band was um, printed on the ticket. It says the Naz. 
but it was their first show they performed as Alice Cooper. Um, so this is this is well known among collectors as the show where they first went on stage as Alice Cooper. Uh, of course, they were they were called the Naz, and then Todd uh, Rundgren had a band <laughs> called Naz. As soon as they found that out, they went, "We got we need a new name, right?" So there's some great stories on how they just kind of picked Alice Cooper because it was a you know, and it sounded like the name of an old lady that lived next door, and really it was five yeah. long haired guys, and how that would uh, juxtapose nicely. But the tickets and the posters for the event still say Naz, the Naz on the bottom, but it was the very first show as the Alice Cooper group. So uh, that's one of my prized possessions, and it's uh, unused and un unmarred or untorn and in really nice shape. Uh, the next one is a little, little CanCon here, a little Canadian content oh, yeah. for us. This is the uh, September 13th, 1969 Rock and Roll Revival, right? Which happened in uh, Toronto. Um, it's got about 6,000 was... versions of it released out there. Oh, uh, or more. And growing uh, every only, day. Only, only one of them good. There's a really nice audio recording of, uh, of this show uh, on a CD out of, uh, out of England, out of the UK, uh, on Apple Bush Records. Uh, it's called Nobody Likes Us. And it's in a nice digi pack. It actually, in some copies, you open it up and chicken feathers fly out. I've got a copy that actually nice. has real <laughs> chicken feathers in it. Yeah. Real nice touch. Uh, and of course, this was, you know, the uh, the site of the infamous chicken incident. So, Fruities for You era stuff, 1969. You know, they went through uh, uh, a half dozen songs um, that were um, off that album. But again, poorly, poorly recorded, and unless you can find uh, this one that's been remastered and pulled directly from the one-inch tapes and speed corrected and actually sounds like them and isn't, isn't yeah. all warped. And the other, all, the, all the other 5,999 renditions of that one, which all have ridiculous names like science fiction or um, I've written home to mother, or all these weird names. Yeah. And there's actually two songs by Ronnie Hawkins on all those. That's right. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's where I like to educate people because I would hate for like a young person that's interested. I, I mean, somebody got, the right to put, to, yeah. to buy, somebody got the to, rights to put, to buy yeah, that, you know, this right to put that sucks. Out. You know what I mean? Yeah, and never listen to terrible. it again. Like ain't I, ain't that, you know, ain't that just like a woman? Is one of the songs. Yeah, it's just like point, this honky tonk. Yeah, at <laughs> one point I figured, well, like just to give you an example, I said, well, I gotta have one copy of this, I suppose. And I, I bought it at a Walmart for like three bucks, and I think it's called Nobody Likes. Yeah, it's called Nobody Likes Me. It's got a it's yeah. got a picture of Alice on the cover, and you can see Kane Roberts. I mean, it, yeah. you know, the pictures aren't period appropriate. And oh, it's just and it's, for it's, three bucks, and and for three bucks, you should have gotten change back. I mean, yeah. I have a ton of them too. Just again, yeah. more so, just you know, you pick them up just so I could. I remember doing a post on my Instagram account, just kind of going like, "Look how ridiculous!" I got one. I got one in London when I was there in 03. I went to a record shop, a cool record shop down by Piccadilly and uh, and found a version that I hadn't seen that had just come out called Blood on My Chopper. And it's him holding up an ax with like a the, the cod piece. And it's, you know, obviously 1986, 1987 yeah. concert shot, right? So what a ridiculous title, Blood on yeah. My Chopper. And then the first song is Ain't That Just Like a Woman by Ronnie Hawkins. Which is so even really, like really... <laughs> really, really. There's really one called tough. snort. There's one called snorting anthrax. Snorting anthrax. Like, like, there's one called ladies man. There's one yeah. called uh, yeah, yeah. Science fiction. I think fiction every one and, of the titles of the songs has been used on there, and the titles aren't even right. The titles are not right. I've I've written home to mother is what lay down and die goodbye. Like yeah, it, yeah. It's exactly <laughs> exactly. And then they've got a version of Don't Blow Your Mind on those that was a really cool version of, of, of the old Spiders Don't Blow Your Mind, but they did a psychedelic version uh, in 1969, which I really wish I'd ended up on an actual studio album. But they, and they had replaced, they slowed it down, really sludgy guitar, uh, but they replaced uh, all the lyrics from Don't Blow Your Mind with uh, these kind of science fiction-y kind of one billion thousand you know light years away and things like that so somebody went like oh it's science we'll call that one science fiction so just ridiculous titles that uh, somebody who didn't it's hard have to clue. um yeah it, it's hard it's hard really hard to listen to but yeah uh, yeah. yeah so that's something to stay uh, away from if you're if you're a curious so, fan something to stay away from unless you can find yeah. the uh the apple bush records got a few uh, i've got quite a few handbills and 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 whatnot uh, or program guides. This is a 1971. So this would have been uh, at the Fillmore East uh, during the Love It to Death years. So 
um, really nice one there. They had uh, Blood Rock, I believe, opening up for them at that. So there's a nice full page on there, and there's a bio on the band. And um, this is the from the Wembley Empire Pool over in London. I've got a uh, killer. This this one's neat because well I've got I had this one signed by Cooper. I don't know if you can see that. This one was signed by Alice Cooper on the front, and it's a nice, clean, intact copy. And it's the version that actually has the playable record. It's still intact, of course. I haven't punched it out, but it's got the uh, it's got a, a dotted line here and a playable little spindle hole that you can pop out. And you can actually it's put one it of those on flexi, your uh, flexi flexi disc. Yeah, well, it's yeah. it's kind of a it's it's on paper, but it's been covered with a bit of a laminate. Yeah. So it's really fragile. Like it's paper. It's not even like, you know, I've got the flexi disc, like the new music, you know, ex the new musical express disc. But this one is uh, obviously staying intact now because it's, it's more of a, you know, collector's piece in that way. And then I've got a diploma from the 1972, the infamous 1972 Hollywood Bowl show. This was one in support of schools out. This one was famous in that uh, they dropped like a 10,000 pairs of panties from a helicopter. <laughs> And then the and then got fined for flying too low. The pilot got fined for flying too low, and Shep had to go bail him out. And there was all these great stories about it. But everybody who attended the show that night got this. Uh, I saw Alice at the Hollywood Bowl diploma, and uh, this was one of the original ones. And then, last but not least, in terms of print pieces, this is one of the more recent ones. She picked up a 2011 uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame program, so it's a large book that has. Uh, a piece on Alice and the other, uh, you know, Neil Diamond, the other uh, artists that went in the same night as the Alice Cooper band. So kind of a kind of a neat little uh, thing to have, just kind of full circle, you know, to get the boys inducted into the Hall of Fame. And uh, yeah, that's what I pulled out to. Uh, oh yeah, sorry, one more, one more. This is a couple of copies of uh, Easy Action on the Bazaar label. So these are quite rare. This this is again one of the Goldmine magazine ranked this as number four on the top five Alice Cooper collectibles in terms of rarity or or uh, you know price it can command or however they uh, determine those types of things. But the story with this, the story that I that I believe to be true is uh, Herb Cohen and Frank Zappa, of course, had straight records and they had Bizarre. They had two uh, label that was kind of split. And I think Bizarre. Uh, Straight was to have more of the radio friendly, as radio friendly as Frank Zappa would ever have on a label. And Bizarre was for the truly kind of out there stuff that Definitely. Frank was known to. And uh, Alice Cooper signed to Straight and at somehow a small handful of easy actions got pressed uh, on a blue, you know, the, the, the printing was put on a, the blue Bizarre label. They got pressed with the blue label as opposed to the straight label, the, the pink straight label and the type and everything was put on it. So it reads easy action. It's got the song titles and everything correct, but it's on the blue bizarre paper label. And it was, you know, it was a mistake. It wasn't, uh, wasn't supposed to happen. So it's unknown how many there are, although I'm a member of a Facebook group, another one that is dedicated just to that uh, LP. <laughs> it's oh, the wow. blue bizarre label Facebook group. So, I mean, there's 23, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that have been logged on there. I think I have copies number 22 and 23 or something like that. So there's probably more out there, you know, uh, there's, there's probably people who may have one in their collection somewhere that don't realize that it's a, a bizarre label. So if you have an old easy action or your dad or your grandpa or anybody out there had an easy action uh, in their record collection, worth checking out and sliding it out. If you see that it's a uh, blue bizarre label, then you can ask a few hundred bucks for it for sure. Well, Mike, that, there's so many things that uh, we could talk about, and this is fascinating to me. I mean, it. Um, I'm a little scared because I want to look through my my records now and stuff, and go. You know, I should really have this one. I should really have that one. So we'll, we'll see how. Well, that if you goes. have any, yeah. If you have any, uh, if you have any recommends, I mean, there's a. It's a big catalog, like I said. It's everybody's got their favorite. That's what's so good about a great big discography like that right is like i know and I, and I don't care what music you like like there's people who go i didn't care for data a lot of people didn't you know that's why it didn't sell that is that is uh that is that is not a shock to hear there are some people who discovered him in 1986 and loved the metal and kind of go i really like uh i like the band stuff and then i like him 86 on i didn't like the the cheesy ballads or whatever and uh to each their own. I got a soft spot for all of them because all of them uh, speak to me in different ways. 
I get in different moods for different things. And, uh, you know, they might take me back to a certain time in my life or even a concert that I was at. But the one thing I'll say, Tim, is, uh, you know, before we, we wrap up is this is all fine and good. And, you know, the, the, the collecting, the, the, the listening, the music itself, but the Alice Cooper community, the collecting community is really what keeps me coming back and wanting to pursue more things in my collection. It is just such a fantastic group of people. Um, and I've just become so close with so many of them. I've never met half of them. Some of them I have, some of them, I, you know, I go to a good records event in Dallas and I have certainly met some people face to face. I've got a couple of great friends that live down in Michigan, um, Corey and his dad, Jeff, that I keep in contact with, but I've got so many friends uh, in, in parts of the world that I've uh, never met face to face, but it feels like we're long lost kindred spirit because of that love of Alice Cooper and Alice Cooper collecting. And they've just helped me out so much. And for some of them, I've helped them out. And, you know, I got a friend in, uh, in the UK named Christopher Daniels, who is, you know, has got a, as big a collection as me, if not more. And, and some of the things on my want list, he has about a dozen things that he, that he has that, uh, that are, that are on my want list. Certain, certain countries pressings of uh, 18 and body the first, uh, you know, the first breakthrough kind of, single pairing, um, you know, different kind of uh, promos and things like that. So, you know, somebody like a Chris who I, he doesn't know me from Adam in terms of uh, personally, but through the Alice Cooper collecting community, he's sent me things. He's advised me on what I've got and like what I'm, what holes I'm missing in my collection. So it's people like him and I, and I've got people around the world who, uh, who I've become close with uh, that truly make it, uh, you know, uh, just a, a one of a kind, a one of a kind thing to to embark on. So, it's really it's really cool. And then you know, even people like yourself, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it wasn't for my Instagram account and your Instagram account becoming you know following each other and whatnot. Absolutely, so, I I'm always curious what you're going to post next. So, like again, uh, everybody at Al Scooper Collector on Instagram, you'll see stuff. I guarantee you'll see stuff you've never seen before. You've seen you'll see stuff that you know maybe you'll see something that you have and you didn't realize was collectible. Absolutely. So, yeah. So Mike, thank you for, for, for doing this. This was a lot well, of my fun. pleasure, Jim. Um, you know, um, I gotta find the rest of those eight trips <laughs> and, uh, yeah. Um, Alice thank Cooper you so much, Tim. This is, uh, like I, like I said, anytime you have got an hour and you want to talk Alice Cooper, uh, feel free to, uh, you know, if you want to, if you want to dive into a specific kind of era or topic and have me back on again, anytime, this has been a lot of fun and I uh, enjoy just talking. Yeah, I enjoy talking right. music in general and, and all, all things Alice. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Mike. So follow Alice Cooper Collector on Instagram. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching this episode of Tim's Vinyl Confessions.